some form of censorship? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. My name's Andy Jong, I'm here to talk about the Internet of Things. It sounds like you've had a, a very long and full weekend and a, a long day today, so I'll, uh, I'll try and do you a favour by keeping this um, brief and succinct. Um, I, I, I prefer to have you know, a little bit of interaction and questions, so, so please feel free to just you know, ask um, if there's something that interests you or if you want to, if you're, maybe if you've got a, a point you'd like to make, so feel free to interject. Uh, just, a, just a bit of introduction so you, you get where, where I'm coming from. Um, uh, I've, I've been a hobbyist uh, since I was a teenager. I sort of loved, loved playing with electronics and software, um, and I've continued that throughout my career. I've been fortunate to um, have worked on many software projects that involved uh, an intimate uh, use of hardware, and uh, including a, an R&D project that ran for over eight years where we were automating a, uh, a fellow's home. And uh, it was a very extensive project. It was a very, very large home, and we were given carte blanche to uh, utilise a whole lot of new technology. Um, but along the way, we, we learned a lot about um, you know, what happens when things fail. It's an area where there's a lot of electrical system, uh, electrical problems, um, uh, just uh, dealing, uh, just dealing with someone's uh, lifestyle, and they had to pick the choices about how they wanted things to work, and trying to get technology to match that. It was quite a quite a learning exercise, um, which is still still informs me today about how how to tackle things. Uh, so how to solve problems of technology. And uh, more recently, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Melbourne Hacker Space, uh, which is an environment where uh, people can come and learn about uh, software, electronics, mechatronics, uh, rockets, robots, um, 3D printing machines, CNC machines, whatever, whatever they like. And we work on group projects in this sort of collaborative environment. Uh, recently, a friend of mine, uh, very, my best friend from high school, sent me a, a scan from our uh, high school yearbook. and. Uh, it's my, my his name on the bottom, patent pending on this robot, where I guess a control cassette tape was being plugged in. And sort of seeing that uh, photograph took me back to um, the mid '70s, um, and uh, the sort of the the, uh, the sort of journey of, um, of uh, electronics and the internet and, and uh, the PC revolution and so on. And uh, an off quote, an off quoted uh, phrase is the best way to predict the future is to invent it by Alan Kay. I also discovered that uh, apparently Abraham Lincoln had an earlier version of it, which was the, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So I think, um, you know, as spending a few minutes looking back at, at history, that the, the streams of technology and society have sort of converged to this point to where we are now talking about the Internet of Things. And uh, so it's been quite a convergence. So, so I'll be talking about uh, transducers, which is the basically uh, converting from one form of energy to another, uh, which allows us to create sensors and actuators. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, internet and a little bit about computers. But basically, uh, for over 100 years now, people have um, been playing with the idea of uh, mechanical, de uh, mechanical electronic devices that um, allow us to measure, measure things. So one of the early things was a piezoelectric crystal, which turns mechanical energy into electricity, or vice versa. Um, and so this, this was, was used uh, for sonar devices during the first uh, World Wars. And then uh, later on, we had things like strain gauges, which allowed you to measure pressure. And then in the 60s and 70s, um, uh, industrial control systems became more prevalent. So there was uh, solid state sen sensors, uh, it was around the, as you mentioned, the transistor, and uh, then integrated circuitry. And uh, more recently, we've had, uh, in the last sort of 30, 40 years, there's been what are called PLC systems, programmable logic, which have replaced ladders of uh, relays. And so it's uh, cheaper, more reliable, faster. And uh, SCADA systems, which stands for um, uh, was it control, con uh, control and acquisition of data, basically. Um, and these, these systems for, for many decades have been closed and proprietary, so they haven't really lent themselves to um, people uh, opening up and looking inside and playing with them. Um, they've, they've been expensive, and uh, probably one of the more recent um, uh, adventures has been what was called the Stuck, uh, Stuck Next Malware, which was uh, attacked a certain type of SCADA system, which was uh, being used at the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear facilities and set their, reputedly set their um, nuclear program back 18 months or so. Uh, at the same time as all this was going on in terms of industrial control, there's also uh, networking. Now, the history of networking it goes prior to 1970. Um, uh, uh, getting computers to talk together has happened since the very early days. But f from my perspective, the interesting stuff started happening around 1970, which was the birth of the, uh, the ARPANET, which ultimately became the, uh, the Internet. It was a U US government uh, uh, supported system. But at, at the time, the uh, DARPANET ended up coming into creation, there's many proprietary systems. So there was uh, IBM had a thing called SNA, uh, there was X25, there was uh, ISO, there's all these competing systems. But what happened was the, uh, uh, effectively TCPIP, which was uh, 
the basis of the ARPANET eventually over, 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 uh, overcame all these systems. And so we now have what is the, fundamental ba the basis for fundamental op op fundamentally open and, and uh, well documented internet, um, which I think has been a much better result than if we had some proprietary system which was basically interconnecting all our computers. And perhaps almost by definition that, that wasn't possible because to, in to interconnect things requires you to, uh, to uh, basically have open documentation, be able to people have different people uh, create their own implementations of, that, of these systems. And if it was only uh, done, so by definition you couldn't be done by a closed, undocumented, secret you know, black box system. You, you know, that wouldn't allow us to, to interconnect things. So, so beyond that, in the 90s, is, um, Tim Berners-Lee uh, created the HTTP protocol, which is what allows us to have uh, web servers talk to, um, or sorry, web browsers talk to web servers, and uh, the last ten years have been about the move from the, uh, the internet tied to our desktops and our mainframes to uh, the internet that allows us to uh, uh, interact through through Facebook and other means on our on our mobile phones. Uh, at, the, at this point in time, there's about two billion people who are, are estimated to be uh, using the internet in some some shape and form. And the other thing going on at the moment is. Uh, the underlying uh, design of the uh, addressing scheme, which is known as uh, IPv4 for Internet Protocol version 4, has effectively run out of addresses and uh, uh, basically there's been a, a mad rush to, uh, imp uh, to uh, introduce IPv6, which has a much larger address space so we can have uh, even more devices on the, on the Internet, which is obviously very prevalent to the notion of the Internet of Things. You know, if you can't have an address, you can't uh, communicate and talk to other things that also have an address. So. And also, whilst that was going on, there was the, the, the PC revolution. So, uh, in, during the, during the uh, early to mid 70s, the uh, integrated circuit uh, was, turned, was uh, employed to create very simple uh, microprocessors. Um, so, starting with the, uh, the, 40, the 4004, which was um, designed by Intel for a, a Japanese company who wanted to create a calculator. Um, so, as a, uh, so any, any of us who sort of grew up throughout the era have, you know, have all got a, 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 our favourite microprocessor. There was a, there was Dozens and dozens of them, um, uh, which uh, didn't didn't last forever. They went they went through a stage where all, all there was was basically Intel processors. But fortunately, we're about now in an era where there's uh, more choice again. So uh, when there was um, desktop desktop machines, it was uh, pretty much mostly Intel or perhaps AMD processors. But now we have mobile phones. There's uh, ARM processors in our um, mobile phones, which um, actually came from the old BBC Micro, or <laughs> in a roundabout way. Um, and in embedded systems, we have things we use the uh, what's called the AVR microprocessor. So it's sort of a bit of a, a golden age again, with a lot of variety and choice, which is always a good thing. But also, so what happened in the seventies was the Homebrew Com Computer Club. I don't know if, if many people have heard of that, but um, that was the a group of people who, who met in uh, Silicon Valley uh, on a regular basis, young young fellows. They'd engage in dumpster diving out the back of uh, Fairchild Electronics or whatever, and they had names like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and uh, Bill Gates and uh, and so on. And uh, I think these people have gone on to be moderately successful in their lives. Um, so, so I've heard. Uh, so what was wonderful about this stage is that uh, anyone could, uh, if they if they wanted to, could have probably afford one of these machines. Uh, starting off with the Altair um, 8800, which in, which included an Intel 8080 processor in it, and it wasn't cheap, but you know it was possible to buy you know, basically buy your own, and build your own computer, which was uh, extraordinary. Um, and over the next ten years, this this became. Commercialized, uh, legitimized, and we have you know, the IBM PC, and, and uh, we have the, the world we have today. But it was a pretty interesting time, and it's fueled by Moore's law, which is about the uh, the uh, doubling of transistors in a given area, which relates directly to the cost and the power consumption of the machine. And so we have the, uh, an extraordinary density of transistors in a small in a small area, which are, uh, which generates you know, doesn't cost much, doesn't use much power, and, and so we have you know, mobile phones and so on. And uh, we had these uh, extraordinary economies of scale, which are built on the, um, the twin, twin pillars of uh, uh, Microsoft software being everywhere and Intel processors being everywhere. Not my choice, but um, it didn't really matter which, 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 um, which software and which hardware. The fact that it was used by hundreds of millions of people meant that it's just you know, it's not going to cost a lot. And uh, these days, you can get the equivalent of those sort of systems from 35 years ago for about a, for about a dollar. I've got dozens, dozens of microprocessors just sitting on the desk here, just a few, for a few dollars each. So the thing I uh, also just briefly cover is in the 1990s, uh, as we've got up here, the internet had been around in the form of the, the ARPANET for about 20 years. The uh, actual internet itself, based on TCP protocol, had been around for about 10 years. I was uh, fortunate enough in the, uh, the mid 80s to work for an American company who was using the internet in the mid 80s uh, to um, support and maintain machines around the Bay, around the San Francisco, Francisco area. And uh, what was interesting about that time, unlike now, is that it was possible to from Australia, travel into the future. We had to basically jump on a plane and go to the US, 
and you'd see things in the US that weren't you know, like the internet, which wasn't to arrive on Australia's shores for at least another five to ten years. Um, you know, uh, at that stage, you, know, you could see a film in the US and it wouldn't appear in Australia for another six months, sometimes even a year. Whereas you know, now we live in an age where um, we sometimes see movies in, a, in a, a release in Australia before the US simply because of the time zones. Um, so back then it was tra possible to travel into the future a short way. And so for me, um, having experienced the internet in the mid 80s, uh, it wasn't a surprise to see it again in the 90s in, in Australia. But what was interesting about that time is um, if you read newspapers, it was all about this internet looks like a bit of a fad, you know, will it last, you know, will it catch up, will it, will it take off? Will it take off? Um, but what happened was uh, in, by, by you know, 93, 94, um, no one was uh, anticipating at all that the fact that it would be Google, Amazon, eBay, and a plethora of others in just a, a few short years. So we knew it was going to be big, but you know, no one really knew what form it was going to take. So here, so here we are in 2011. And we have uh, you know, Linux in many of our phones. I think Android's probably the I think probably the largest uh, smartphone smartphone platform now, I believe. And we've got things like the Arduino, which John has spoken about. So there's these little microprocessors you can get for uh, sorry microcontroller boards you get for about twenty dollars. And interesting enough, um, Google recently announced that the Arduino will be used as their um, uh, the hardware interconnection between Android and uh, being a basic effect when you dock your Android phone or tablet somewhere that potentially it could be an Arduino talking to it, which is, is good news for us who have invested a lot of time in Arduinos. Um, as John mentioned in his talk, um, open source hardware has been around for about five, five years now and there's now organisations who make a, a healthy living um, by selling open source hardware that anyone else in the world can copy and yet um, people are realising it's not about the copying, it's about offering uh, value and service to your customers, not about um, about ripping things off. And we have, uh, you can get sensors and actuators for pretty much any physical property you can imagine. Uh, gas detection, uh, weight, acceleration, light, um, you know, smell, it just, just goes on. Uh, there's a so-called cloud, where so there's a place now for all this, all this data to go. Um, but what we've got is a, a, a million and one automation protocols. So we just rattle them off for, you know, for minutes on end. Um, so there's a lot of um, fragmentation. And, uh, uh, but we do have uh, some, some, some open standards, um, but there's, not, there's simply not enough. So for example, if, um, uh, if you know, uh, sensor data from one, one instrument won't necessarily interact or we sensor data from one instrument or won't interact with some website because they're using a different API or protocol. So we're not going to be able to build large scale Internet of Things with this sort of fragmentation. Um, but we do have um, smartphones. So uh, smartphones are pretty much always connected and they've got accelerometers, uh, light sensors, all sorts of things. So pretty much the the Internet of Things already exists, it's already around us, it's just not, uh, it's just not uh, in a form that's uh, particularly useful yet. So, uh, so to, to my mind, this is a bit like what the, uh, the microprocessor was like, what it was like before the PC revolution. You've got um, uh, things are becoming affordable, you've got uh, hobbyists experimenting, you've got commercial interests, um, but there isn't yet um, st standardisation yet in the way that it was the IBM PC or yet the economies of scale. Um, hacker spaces, uh, which are Pretty much in most capital cities around the world, you can just go to hackerspaces.org and see this massive list of people who are self-organising and uh, sharing experience and building things. Um, it's pretty much like a homebrew computer club you know, in each and every city, you know, with the potential to do extraordinary things. And uh, and pretty much as John has claimed his talk, you can access a, a global chain of design and manufacturing to build to build drones, custom stuff quite affordably. Um, so, for example, there was a global hackerspace challenge uh, a couple of months ago. And in six weeks, we went from, from nothing to a to a completed prototype, which included the three month sorry the three week uh, delay of getting um, boards built you know, in China, and uh, so we ended up with something that looked, looked like looked like that. And it was it was built for just a few hundred dollars, and uh, there's, there's three three uh, boards inside. One of them based on the Arduino design, open science, so we could quite happily um, replicate it and change it to our needs. And uh, this is a project. This is a the, the challenge was to build something that could be used in education, and so 30 hackerspaces around the world um, basically put that, uh, took that brief and uh, basically uh, came up with all sorts of extraordinary things. The winner was um, was a, uh, a system based on fuzzy felt, where you basically had a board, and much like, it's much like this, and you basically take fuzzy felt pieces that represent pieces of electronics and just put them on the board and connect things together and make electronic circuitry. So it was designed for, I guess, uh, Kids in a late primary school or early high school to, to build to build electronics in a in a very friendly fuzzy way. So, uh, right. So so going from from here, the things I'd I'd hope to see happen is uh, 
adoption, adoption and support of, of open standards because when, um, when, you have, when you have open standards, uh, things can be interconnected and you don't end up being locked into a particular vendor, which is pretty important. Um, things, things should be affordable uh, for, a, for the whole, whole um, history of the industrial control systems world. It's been, these things have been closed and they've been very, very expensive. Thousands of dollars to do something that we can now build for just uh, tens of dollars. And we need a scalable and secure architecture. Um, uh, you know, security is obviously very important to protect people's privacy and identity, um, but, but in the end it won't, won't be enough because you can always do traffic analysis or there's going to be other leakage of information. So it can never be perfect, but we really should have a, a little bit of a go so that we're not, you know, so 100 million people don't lose their uh, credit card information because Sony were you know, slack or incompetent. Um, and it's about so it's about allowing the barrier to entry on everyone and. Uh, what I'd do is say in comparing um, open systems versus closed systems is probably no one remembers the uh, networking systems from the 70s or 80s, but pretty much everyone is using TCPIP, yeah, which is an open system. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. No, I was using X25 and X28. Oh, cool. <laughs> wow. Uh, what, what, so uh, what systems are you using X25 on? Uh, 6809. Wow, I know, that's a very small microprocessor. Um, FPOS. Okay. Yeah. Well, 6809 was my, my favourite microprocessor. Yeah. Um, what about 6800? Um, that was prior to 6809. So it was, um, but yeah. oh, the 6809 had um, uh, pipelining, had a 16 bit multiply, and also had divide instruction. So that, that made it a little bit nicer than the 6800 for the things I was working on. But it's all personal preference. They're all, they're all great in their own way. Um, all right, so. Enough history. Um, move, so moving forward from here, so interacting with the world role. Um, it's one thing to have a, a handful of devices you know, where you just maybe just got a, te a temperature sensor or a single or a single tank water level sensor. It's a whole other uh, matter when you're dealing with billions and billions of devices and um, having them uh, all creating information, have that information flow somewhere and analyze that and analyzing that data. Uh, these things need to be uh, small, low powered, because um, power uh, power is always the uh, the killer design issue. Uh, the, design implementation issue, you know, if you're powering these devices, um, we don't want to be replacing batteries, we may not be in a position where you can run power cables from the grid to these things, and similarly with comms, so, so that's always a bit of a problem. But we've also uh, got to um, deal with the sensors and actuators, you know, the choices of, uh, of hardware, just, just to have the experience to know what, 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 what's available, what you can choose. And uh, the end, end result is basically come up with a, a low cost design that allows us to happen. So here's there's many ways to skin a cat, and here's, here's one way. The way I personally look, tend to look at things is the, the wide area network, so basically the, uh, the internet, the cloud, where, you, where um, you might have hosted solutions storing data. The LAN, the local area network, which might be in your home or in your vehicle or in an office building, where you've basically got uh, servers uh, locally storing data and routing between them. And then the uh, personal area network, uh, where you've got the actual devices themselves and the sensors. So that's one way of, of architecting this, this is internet of things. So just going through those uh, briefly, the uh, wide area network uh, is where you might have hosted sites. There's a number of uh, starting to appear now. So uh, Tube has been around. It's a European group. They've been around for a year or two now, a years. Uh, Things Speaks a new one. I think that's from the US. Uh, Smart Energy Groups has uh, been created by a, a local fellow, Sam Savey, in, in Melbourne. And that's um, around uh, getting uh, community monitoring and management of, uh, of their energy uh, utilisation. And Google Power Meter, which uh, Google just uh, announced only recently that um, they're terminating that program. So which is Unfortunate for the uh, organisations, people invested you know, potentially millions of dollars and many hours of their their time. Uh, uh, so, so with this wider network, what's important is to have uh, have documented ways of, um, of, in, of interacting with these with these websites. Um, you know, to worry about the, the back end data storage, you know, who, who's who's managing that, you know, who who's owns the data. Can you, can you trust that it's not going to be uh, used for purposes you didn't intend? Um, they also provide um, web-based web presentations, so in the form of graphing and other other sorts of tools. And uh, what we'll see is, um, this is pretty much early days, there'll be more and more people building these websites and trying to uh, uh, encourage people to use them. So you know, we, all know, we all know about Facebook, we, um, we uh, probably, uh, MySpace is not yet history, but fewer people remember that before that there was Friendster. So what we'll see now is these, these websites that exist now are really just the front runners. We're, we probably haven't seen the Facebook of the, the Internet of Things yet. Okay, so just looking at the local area networking, this is where in your home, you might have a, or building might have, might have an automation system. Um, I personally, I've got a, 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 I personally favour little things like little Wi-Fi, little Ethernet routers that are pretty much like you just go and buy from a, a Harvey Norman or whatever electronic store. 
What's great about these devices is that uh, from, manu from the manufacturer, they're using running, running a version of Linux that, um, that they, they, they uh, tailor to their purposes. But in most cases, you can basically put your own version of Linux on there and start writing your own software for these devices. Or, or basically, you can um, download software from someone you trust. And what that does is um, ext oh, it extends the functionality beyond it just simply being a router for the internet to then when it allows you to control devices in your home and to um, uh, provide user interfaces to control a device at home. All, all for a device that's $50. No moving parts. Yeah, hi. I'm just feeling a little bit unclear. Could you define the Internet of Things? Oh, okay, sure. Quick, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm, I feel that's a bit remiss. Basically, the, in, the Internet of Things is, is uh, looking at uh, what is potentially the next um, big shift in where people are focusing their attention. So at the moment, everyone's focusing their attention on mobile phones and, and, and mobile phones being connected to the Internet. So we, we have, first we have mobile phones, now we have mobile phones with Internet capability. Before that, we had desktops and uh, then we had desktops that are on the internet, and before that we had mainframes. What we have now is we have a whole lot of devices that um, sense and, and uh, provide control. So we have um, uh, you know, dams, or, or we have, uh, uh, I know what else, uh, 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 robotic automation systems in factories, we have um, things that control uh, air conditioning and uh, power, light and heat. These all have control systems, but they're not yet on the internet. And so the next uh, thing we're likely to see is where these billions and billions of control uh, devices around the world actually get connected on the internet. Now, and what can we do with all these things once they're connected and we can start analysing the data from you know, our energy usage, our vehicles you know, running around the city, for, if we, what if we knew the location of every car in town, where, you know, what direction and how fast it was going, you know, what good or evil things can we do with that data? Um, yeah, so what if, what if, um, if all, everyone's, you know, every building's air conditioning was on the net and we could basically say, look, as, as the weather pattern moves through, what, as the cool change comes through Melbourne, start turning off the ones in the west you know, so, oh, and, 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 and leaving the other ones in the east to stay on or something like that so we're not using as much energy, that type of thing. So the Internet of Things is literally, take it quite literally, all these things in the world connected and on the internet for, for good or bad. That smart chair that you'll be sitting on will be very smart in a few years' time. <laughs> well, uh, bizarre <laughs> things happen. One of, the, one of them is uh, a bunch of hackers uh, hacked, a, hacked an office chair, so had a gas sensor. <laughs> and uh, had had a had a little had a little wireless net connection, and yes, it was um, whenever someone farted, it tweeted. <laughs> so, um, 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 so again, did you have to go into training for that? <laughs> no, no, no I, th I think it was I think it was uh, one of those experiences that just came naturally. <laughs> so, so look, look, please, please, if if if, if, if this is sort of uh, not making sense, please just stop me and ask questions because I don't want to waste you know, waste your time. And, and so yeah, just feel free to just jump up and say stuff. Especially if you've got a favourite microprocessor from the 70s. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so in, in your local area network, at the moment, yeah, you'll have a, a Wi-Fi router and you'll have uh, maybe an iPad or, or, or a laptop at home. But that can be extended out to also include the other devices in your home so you can see you know, how much uh, energy your fridge is using or your TV <coughs> set or your, um, or, or your lighting. And once you start to measure this information, you can also start to make decisions about, uh, well, maybe I don't need to have my hot water service heating up at 3 a.m. in the morning when no one's using it. And, you know, consuming electricity for no good purpose. Maybe it should just come on at six in the morning, just in time for me to get up. And uh, so, sort of things I'm looking at. Uh, well, not only me, but a lot, a lot of people around the world looking at is what, how do we put these systems together? And what sort of protocols can we use? And uh, one, one I'm particularly interested is called uh, MQTT. It's uh, an open and very lightweight protocol. And if we can make decisions about about doing common things like that, we can then connect our devices together. So, do so, so you have a question? Or yeah? okay. so. Uh, so ra ra routers are things that uh, routers are devices that connect things. So I just mentioned before that this, this router allows you to connect uh, iPads and laptops to the internet. Well, we can we can change these routers, uh, which have um, if they cost fifty dollars. They've got Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Um, they they run Linux, which allows us to be able to hack them, and then we can add uh, we can uh, augment them. Uh, so it's a matter of just choosing protocols that allow us to publish, like MQTT, that allows us to publish and subscribe information. So what that's about is allowing device to just publish every every minute. You know, I'm, I'm using as much power, or hey, I'm turned on, and then things can subscribe to that to that to that channel of information, and then make decisions based on the information they're receiving. So it's a, so it's pretty pretty straightforward. Personally, I like things to be uh, what's called asynchronous, which means things are proactively tell you. You don't have to go and poll them. And the other, other nice things to just be able to deal with failure. So. So I think that last will and testament means that, for example, a device um, vanishes, um, well, if it's, if it's dropped off the network or failed, it can no longer tell you. So what's nice is to have published the last will and testament, which basically says, should I, should I, should I as a device die or go missing, here's, here's some, some information that, um, 
you, know, you should know. So it's sort of. So when it comes to the personal area network, this is where we start to use things like the embedded microprocessors, like, like the Arduino that John was talking about. And you, you have a number of ways of connecting these things to the network. Um, obviously, we've heard a lot about Wi-Fi, but in the future, we'll start to hear more about mesh networks with protocols like Zipi, which allow uh, uh, devices when they've sort of only got a low power and very small, you can't have a lot of these things talking all the way back to an access point in the middle of the house. So what you do with a mesh network is you have a... Uh, these devices can hop their messages from one to the other. So if you imagine in your home, you have, oh, like here, you've got a whole lot of curtain rails down the, uh, the side of the room. Rather than the curtain rail down the very end trying to talk directly to the server up this corner of the room, what the messages can hop from curtain rail to curtain rail. And that's, that's why, why we, use, we use things like mesh networking. It means that the, each hop is, is shorter. Yeah, power core, uh, power core. Uh, the smart meters used to be. Sorry, which one? Sorry. Power core smart meters. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It was mandated that um, in Victoria the smart meters should use Zigbee. The tragedy is it was, it was just not enabled. So not they paid for a, something that's just not turned on. Um, there's a, a picture of some uh, different form factors for Arduinos. Jo John showed you one that was that was this size. Um, they can also come a lot smaller. So that's a, a tiny one, like a postage stamp size. You can use that for wearable computing or putting it some places. You can also um, uh, customise them and put other, yeah, it doesn't have, an Arduino doesn't have to be exactly as it, as it, as it came from the manufacturer. You can you re repurpose the design that's done here. This one's got um, mesh networking, it's got an SD card for storage, it's got a barometer so it knows how high it is, it's got an accelerometer, it's got GPS so it knows where it is. Um, uh, this, this is a, uh, exactly the same board that went up in that uh, high altitude balloon launch that John show, showed before. It was designed to go into, into a rocket payload for rocket avionics. So you can just easily stick it in your car on your push bike. Uh, what would what, be nice is if, uh, if push bikes, uh, you know, you knew how, you know, where they were, how much, they've, uh, how much they're being used, and we could um, say, say to the government, hey, look, this is what, what's, what's going on with push bikes. We should have more bike paths you know, in this area. You know, look, you know, all these bikes that are just driving on this really busy street, wouldn't it be better to get them off the road where it would be, uh, be safer? So it's so telemetry can be used for all sorts of good things. Uh, so I'll just briefly, the, so the Arduino is a, a, a low-cost microcontroller that basically uh, has a number of digital inputs and outputs that it can, um, it's very easy to program. And there's a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot, big and active community of people who are, uh, who, who are using these devices. And, uh, and uh, it's open source so that um, all the designs can be uh, viewed and modified. Uh, so it's basically look like, look like that, so you've got a, some headers for having inputs for having inputs and outputs. There's USB ports, so it just hangs off your computer, so I can just uh, it's very easy to program. It's powered by USB and just talks straight back to your computer. And it's what we call a, a system on a chip. So whereas previously you would have to have built a computer out of um, the processor and memory and, and uh, input and output and clocks and and uh, and so on, it's basically all on all on one chip. And uh, where that becomes very powerful is uh, this is a little board with a, an LED, but on the back of it is a complete computer in a chip, which costs about a dollar. And uh, you can buy these boards for about fifteen dollars uh, from the in, in the US or from Australian sites. What we're doing in the hacker space is we're showing people how to build these for about three dollars. So the notion, uh, so it's so just a, it's a blinking LED that can be you know, with multiple colours and you can make give two scripts that can blink in different ways, perhaps on Christmas or Halloween. But the important notion is that for a dollar, you can basically attach that to any device you could con uh, consider and basically connect it up and put it on the internet um, so you can measure and control stuff. So, so um, that's, that's what's important about systems on a chip and uh, really cheap microprocessors. So if you, so to, to wrap up, I'll get the slide talk about some examples. So there's a lot of, a lot of domains. I've, I've mentioned here you know, environmental, uh, you know, monitoring, obviously uh, in, in times of disaster to be able to you know, uh, you know, measure earthquakes or tsunamis or, uh, or, the, or the radiation uh, that, that may occur after a, after a disaster strikes your country. Um, one, one, one of the things that happened in, in uh, Japan was some of the local hacker spaces uh, tried to put together open source uh, radiation counters so that the uh, uh, citizens could um, you know, determine for themselves whether things were safe or not. Uh, the other thing to do is monitor search scarce resources. Um, it's pretty much a given that electricity bills are going to double every five years, 70% per year. So being able to measure and uh, reduce your consumption would be good. Unfortunately, probably it's not going to stop the bills going up. Uh, safety notification in terms of uh, bushfires. You know, if if basically having devices uh, spread throughout an area, if the devices stop talking, you know, it's probably a good idea to uh, leave that area. 
uh, and, and monitoring before on the panel um, medical information is uh, mentioned. So, uh, so for example, if you're able to put uh, like on a, a young infant's jumpsuit, uh, an accelerometer, so you, that you can tell that the, uh, your infants are uh, uh, still breathing, or if they've turned over in their crib, which um, uh, can be uh, can be a problem if they turn onto their stomach uh, for in the case of SIDS, to be able to have the information uh, would augment you know, the baby monitor quite a lot. And for elderly, to know if um, people in their homes uh, have fallen over, or they've left the gas on, or if they're getting enough exercise, or, or if they've used the fridge. Um, they, it's, 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 it's clear we can see the potential good in this, but also uh, there's also potential concerns as well. Um, being able to monitor endangered species, you know, be able to see the um, uh, uh, cutback of forests and things, or uh, how that's affecting habitat. And also things like traffic flow, to simply know where all the cars are and be able to plan, plan road systems and tra travel, trip, travel would be good. So that brings me finally to, to, to risks and uh, who do we trust. Um, uh, there's plenty of discussion about Facebook, about when you click through and upload fo uh, photographs, about how they can pretty much do anything they like with those photographs. Um, this is not the sort of thing we want, want to, we want to be happening to our data, and yet that's I mean, sort of where we just click through to agree on stuff about reading, that's kind of what's happening. Um, there's also what happens when you have uh, your data stored somewhere else. So you know, if your data is being stored um, around the world on Amazon servers or whatever, you're pretty much at the mercy of what, uh, whatever government controls those organisations. So you know, Twitter's been uh, f uh, forced from time to time to have to give up data, as, it, as, it, as, as other places. Uh, <laughs> they can be just, just basically incompetence. So um, you know, Sony uh, w uh, was hacked and lost 100 million uh, account, uh, in, uh, people's account information. Uh, Distributed IT, an Australian company, um, for whatever reason, a uh, uh, mistake was made and 20, uh, several thousand websites are, are gone completely. People have put their, people whose businesses put all their data up onto this hosted solution. Um, the data's gone, can't be recovered. Um, so hopefully that didn't take too many people out. Uh, in the case of Dropbox, uh, for a few weeks ago, for, four, for a period of four hours, you didn't need a password to uh, use Dropbox. And so you could basically access anyone's account and their data if you only knew that that was the case. They, 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 they did a software upgrade, they made a mistake, and then they found it, but for four hours. Um, so this, this stuff is happening all the time. I, I don't know if it's happening more or less, but certainly getting reported a whole lot more. And, and so you know, these are the places where we're starting to have data. I don't, I'm not using this as a, a reason to say we shouldn't be doing this, I, but I would say that we need to be getting a lot better at it than we currently are, for sure. And then there's finally this poor government policy. Um, the Victorian Smart Reader rollout, I personally think, is just a, a disaster, really. My key, yeah. Say again? My key. Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't even mention that one. Oh. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's... Yeah. Oh, let's talk, to talk about my key. Uh, I, I, I fail to see why... Many cities around the world are, uh, are re-implementing uh, transport systems from scratch and spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, to re-implement something that's already being implemented somewhere else in the world. I can't believe that Victorian transport system is so different that we have to start from scratch as, a, as opposed to leveraging off Oyster in London or, or Hong Kong. With a company else. that never did it before. Yeah. Um, there's a Tanco, I believe, yeah. And with the difference being, tra the primary difference being our tram network, and now they're cutting out of the system. Anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> So the yeah, things the is one thing it, it does when you have many systems it creates competition yeah. and OISA could have charged like a whole lot of money and they thought it might have been cheaper to go with yeah. Mikey. So I mean if you have more than one system it creates competition, but perhaps improves the system. Well, what it's just is I can't imagine our transport system is any more complicated than um, an operating system and if, uh, if, uh, if the world can share Linux and then tailor that to their individual pieces of hardware and application needs then surely we, we could start with an open source solution and some standards as a starting point and then pay a few million dollars to, uh, sorry, a few tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to tailor it to our local environment. But at least by starting off, you know, with something 50% done, you, you, know, you reduce your risk. Anyway, so I think that is... Brisbane has go-kart. <coughs> yeah, yeah, Brisbane has go, yeah, exactly. Why, uh, why, why, isn't, why aren't Victoria and uh, Brisbane sharing, sharing uh, the, the implementation of go-kart? Yeah, so we're, we're, just, we're basically we're, we're allowing our government to do it wrong. We should insist on better value for our tax, our tax money, basically. Um, but these are all examples of um, of, of the risks of um, of of, uh, of outsourcing, offshoring, and, and so on. And I'm not saying we should do this because um, there's, there's benefits. We just have to be get better at it. And uh, especially when it starts to become our, loca our, our location, our medical records are much more private detail, our details. To be honest, our, our poor kids will probably have to grow up a lot more with their identity theft than we ever had to. So there's some some thoughts about how we might so, uh, go some way to solving this, mostly education. 
mostly avoiding monopolies. Um, I don't recommend, I'm not suggesting we don't uh, utilise any of these organisations, I'm just suggesting that we don't utilise them 100%. Uh, um, we should uh, be using, there should be a number of Facebooks, there should be a number of Googles, and a number of Apples and so on, and these, they should, these companies should have built things so to interoperate, so our, 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 our iPods will interact with our Android machines, which will interact with our Xboxes and so on, and that's the world that we should be living in, where consumers can choose and have their stuff work together. Um, yeah. Yeah, if we're educated, we can ask the hard questions of, uh, of, of governments and CEOs. We, uh, yeah, we can, you know, if we don't like something, we just don't buy it. We just buy something else. Yeah, corporate organisations react pretty, pretty sp strongly to, um, to products that don't sell well. Um, uh, companies, you know, there should be encryption and backups, but encryption isn't a complete answer because you can still do traffic analysis. So that, that um, interaction with that porn site was encrypted, but the fact you actually went to the porn site still tells the government something. Um, not that I see anything around here we do, but I just bring that up as an example. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just simply, it's, it's, not, it's not what you said, the fact that it's simply you said it to someone is, is also information, and you can't hide that. Um, backups, and, and just do it yourself. You know, learn, learn how to do some of these things, and not always just rely on others to do it correctly for us. So, uh, that's it. Um, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Uh, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Yourself side. Yes. I, I really like that, especially the example you gave of things like putting Arduino units on bikes. Mm -hmm. How feasible do you think it is for everyone to get involved in the making movement? Um, well, do it yourself can also be do it with someone else. Um, uh, it, it, it's not it's not everyone's interested in this stuff. Not everyone will be willing to learn it. Uh, that's, so it's not feasible that everyone will do it. But what what everyone can do is support it. Um, uh, so you, you can, you can um, yeah, everyone can choose to learn that such things are possible and support you know, the uh, other people doing it. So um, you know, if there's a community group who are doing, who are doing this, you know, maybe electronics isn't anything, but maybe you're, you're good with management or helping uh, funding or, or good at promoting. Uh, so I think, I think everyone can get involved at, some, at the level that suits them. Um, what Andy's basically saying is you can't fit four million people in his garage. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, we have to make that miniaturised mission team. No, but, uh, but I think what I can say is that a lot more people could get involved. So, for example, um, you know, you would, everyone I think would have been impressed, pretty impressed with John's talk, and I was. Um, but we can't all be John. Um, but what, what we're doing like Pack Space in the, over the next uh, couple of months is we're running a, a workshop which shows people how to build, how to build these, how to build these little LEDs. You know, basically, um, we'll basically show people how to do the design, and they, sorry, they will do the design, they'll purchase the parts, they'll send, they'll send a PCB off to get made in China, they then do the surface mount with the, uh, with the tricky uh, microscope and surface mount uh, toaster oven, and, uh, and then burn the firmware and, and so on. And not because they expect everyone's going to go off and build a whole of these things, but they can use those techniques to, um, to do their own ideas, to, to, to basically take their own ideas to production. Or, or they just might think, cool, I've done it, I know it can be done, and now my business can, um, can, can go off and get that stuff done. So, uh, so, I think it, yeah, so I think more people can be doing, can get involved, but not everyone. Um, Andy, just at the start of the talk, you were mentioned the um, Home Automation Project, yep. and um, I've heard you mention in the past things like emergent behaviour. Yes. Do you care to share any anecdotes about emergent behaviour you saw in, um, in complex systems that you were developing? Oh gosh, um, I can certainly remember a few cases of bizarre behaviour, um, emergent. Um, yeah, the, the idea of emergent behaviour is where if you have um, lots, of, lots and lots of simple things, um, unexpected results will happen. Sometimes they'll be unexpectedly good and sometimes they'll be unexpectedly bad. Um, but what, we've, what we found was um, if we had things like uh, uh, lights that turned on or off um, uh, as, as, as you moved in and out of rooms and, and music that follows you around the house and other things, you get, you get some, some nice behaviour that if you, if you had to get up in the middle of the night to go to the loo, you could you know, walk to the bathroom and your you way you way be lit and so we so that was a very simple case we didn't actually program that into the system it was basically something that the uh, the owners sort of said oh we're, I'm really glad you guys did this and going well we, we kind of didn't it just like that was just came out of the fact that um, you know, we, we were connecting up movement to lights um, 
uh, on more bizarre behaviour, um, what we found is that we had, we had every, every room had a touch screen, so there's 22 odd touch screens around the around this home, and uh, what we found was uh, the owners complaining about, oh, the, all the controls seem to be getting messed up and what's going on. We sort of we, we, we looked at the hardware, we looked at the software, and eventually we discovered that the the cleaner had been going around and squirt, the windows squirting and then using <laughs> and rubbing the screens, and, and so we thought, oh, we need to we need to basically provide an interlock and, and stuff like that. So yeah, there's, there's things like that. Other emergent behaviour happened because you have know, animals running through the roof and, 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 and causing systems to um, to go off. You know, obviously, obviously things like security and, and so on. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's amazing uh, when, when you've got when you've got a lot of a lot of hardware. So I think it was about uh, there's 40 locks and, and uh, door locks and window locks. Uh, there's um, four, uh, four pools, five heating cooling systems, nine home theatres. Um, there's gates and all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, lots, lots could go, lots could go wrong, and, and lots of things happen. We just, just couldn't explain what, what happened. It's an interesting project. We have time for one more question. Is there anybody who hasn't been asking any questions? We'd like to ask one now. Interested in the privacy aspects. Uh, you know, with my key, the government, uh, police don't need a warrant to get your travel history uh, with these power meters. Uh, you know, they can find out when you, you know, are you at home and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they can infer a lot about personal habits and so on. And one of the panelists was very blase about, you know, you have no privacy, get over it. But then he later made a comment that uh, he was uncomfortable that Facebook was using his information to. Uh, you know, uh, ran ad ads down his throat. Um, so, what's your your sort of take on that? Um, and how do we how that? Uh, you know, how do we how do we um, be a bit more proactive about this sort of thing? I mean, young people are very blasé about road safety until a few of their friends get killed, and that's generally what happens. You blasé about these things until sort it of blows up in your face. Sure. Well, certainly, when it comes to the nature of um, making your data available online, there's a, a whole spectrum. Uh, I know people who, who who are aware of the implications and they're still happy to do it. I don't think it counts if you say someone's unaware and they're doing stuff. I think it's sort of like that and maybe the constitution. But I know, I know people who who know all the implications and do this. Other people who really don't want to provide any information at all. So I think uh, is that there isn't. We can't. We're not going to be able to put something in place that pleases everyone. Um, uh, there are some tech, there are some techniques you can do in terms of like delaying data. So for example, if you uh, for example. There's a site about when it comes to tweeting. There's a site that says um, there's something called, like, called like, you know, robyourhouse.com or something like that, where it was basically going through Twitter feeds and putting up information to say, hey, this house is now, you know, we, we basically <laughs> based on the Twitter information, this house is now vacant, and uh, this, this guy was trying, I guess, trying to uh, promote, uh, was trying to make aware, uh, raise awareness that um, what you're tweeting allows the bad guys to, to do stuff, um, and so and so it goes with um, with your your usage patterns around the house. You can tell if um, someone's uh, home or not. When they when they uh, when they go to sleep, um, when they go on holidays, so I think you can do things like you can, you can time delay. So you can say simply say so data doesn't become broadly available until um, until some time has gone past. Uh, you can do things like you can aggregate you can aggregate home, home, uh, make uh, make data homogenous. So you can say look, um, you ca uh, we can't we, people are not allowed to sell uh, on sell individual information. They're going to um, uh, make general statistics available like. You know, 50 percent of people, you know, like the bell curve, when people seem to get up in the morning. But the problem with that is, um, oh, about a, a chat, Pat, maybe two years ago. Um, uh, now, who was it? Was it uh, Yahoo? Maybe um, uh, released a whole lot of information on purpose to researchers. Um, uh, data which they, they think they, they felt they had cleansed. They'd removed IP addresses, all sorts of other information. And was, I think it was just search information on, on Yahoo. I think it was, I think it was Yahoo. AOL. Maybe someone else. Yeah, yeah, AOL. yeah, AOL. AOL. Um, but. Uh, researchers were still able to go back through that, and were actually able to find indi individual people, and uh, and and uh, from their from this, the things they were searching on, uh, even though the data had been cleansed. So um, so it doesn't appear to be any bulletproof solutions to this problem. Um, personally, I think uh, the best we can do is to be educated about uh, what what data is being captured. No, I think what, what, first thing is, is there should be probably legislation to to for, to. Uh, for organisations to be transparent about what they're doing, so you know, everyone got a bit of a shock when it was discovered that Apple Apple devices were um, keeping a location cache. Now, um, I, I, I didn't make any assumptions about whether Apple were doing that for good or bad, 
the first thing that occurred to me is that it was obvious that they needed that information to provide some of these services that the phone provided to their own user. So it could, you know, there's every reason to believe it was completely innocent. But what Apple should have done is they should have um, let users be aware that that's happening. And um, these days when you get the iTunes, you click an agreement that's um, probably about 50 pages long. 67. 67, they go, who's going to read that? Um, that's you know, saying it's buried down in you know, page 37 is not making people aware. So, um, and I guess everyone, when you get, when you get some change to your credit card, you get these big, thick books from your bank about changes, about, about policies, you go, what, what is that? So, so people need to be made aware of what, what data is being captured and what purpose is being used. Um, I think we should, um, there should be best effort to, to marginalise data, and, and there should really be some stricter penalties on, on, uh, on companies that um, aren't uh, protecting people's data correctly. You know, companies should not be allowed to say, oh, the data goes over in the clear and we encrypt on our server. No, it should be encrypted end to end. You know, so I don't know if, if everyone's heard of FireSheep. It was a, a Firefox plugin that would uh, basically just look for, um, uh, when you're on, on a Wi Fi hotspot, just look for uh, Twitter and Facebook data because uh, uh, traffic. Because what happened was um, your, uh, a cookie was being used to uh, uh, credit your session, um, but there's nothing stopping anyone from grabbing that cookie and then just basically being doing, you know, man, uh, basically taking over your uh, Facebook session or your Twitter session and being, being you. So that, that stuff should be um, you know, not permitted. Put your hands together for Andy. Right now, we've had enough talk just before lunch. Um,